credit our kind sponsors, things like this uh, don't happen automatically. Um, and we have funding that was provided for all the food, um, you know, helping to get the right people here, et cetera, um, by the NCAR directorate office, by UCAR, um, and by the three laboratories involved. And that's the Research Applications Lab, the Computing and Information Systems Lab, and Climate and Global Dynamics Lab. So, Yes, and Lynn, and because Linda has been part of all those labs over the years, um, but uh, including NCAR and UCAR director themselves too. So Seth. Thank you. Um, our, um, our first speaker for this afternoon is uh, Joel Smith, who's talking about benefits of hindsight. Because the, uh, the the title is so long, if I read it, it'll take up my fifteen minutes. Sorry, Linda. The uh, the movie version will have a shorter title. Once we figure out who plays you and me. All right. Oh, that's a great idea. I like that. All right, I'm okay. I'm wired. So um, let me begin here, and I am going to interject with a, a few little stories about Linda because I've had the pleasure of. Knowing you now, how do I advance this? Uh, left arrow, oh, here's a clicker. Is this it? Uh, nope, not that button. Just the, the right arrow button. Nope. Well, what I was going to say was <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, there we go. There. So that one. Aha. Uh -huh. That one. Okay. There we go. There we go. How do we do that stuff? Get back to uh, where is it? Oh, it's under more high floating meeting controls. There we okay. Go. All right. So um, Cynthia Rosenzweig uh, showed the uh, cover of the uh, infamous EPA effects report. It was. 37 years ago, almost to this day, was that we had an, a meeting to organize that report in Boulder. I had just been hired. I was at the Environmental Protection Agency. I knew nothing about climate change. And after this talk, you might say, he still knows nothing about climate change, but you could, <laughs> you could see. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, um, at the, but I, we came out to Boulder and uh, got to meet, gosh, Steve Schneider, uh, Martin Perry, Cynthia Rosenzweig, Bill Travis, who's not here, Bill Easterling. I don't know if Bill Easterling, if he was there at that meeting, but he was involved with this project. And Linda Burns, we got to meet. And Linda uh, worked on climate variability, which I'll get back to in this talk at some point. But, um, and uh, you actually helped, you had this, you had a paper in the appendix. I, I still have a copy of it. It was the last of our appendices, but not the least important. You had a paper with Steve Schneider, Starley Thompson, and I forgot who the uh, the fourth person it was. Enough. But anyway, but and you wrote the chapter on variability, which we wisely put early in in the report before we got to the impact stuff. You know, we had a science chapter and variability, and I think you guys were also trying to look at how well the models simulated variability. But I thought. This study, and Cynthia mentioned yesterday, it really was sort of the first country study. We were trying to say, how serious is this issue? Should you take it seriously? That was that was really the issue. How what 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 could the effects be? We looked in 2030 and 2060, double CO2 scenarios, but really, we didn't really have transients. And um, it's interesting to go back and look at what we projected at that time and say, well, were we right? Or were we wrong? <laughs> um, so let's go, come with me on this venture. Whoops, I just must. And But I am going to intersperse this with, a, if Linda indulges me, a couple of stories of Linda. I'll do one now and one towards the end. We had a number of meetings in this report. Wait, is that Zambezi Falls, mind you? I found that in the internet. Aguasu oh, Falls. Okay, very good. All right. Um, so... Uh, we had a number of meetings in Washington. We dragged all these people and we had like 50 projects and Linda needed a hotel room and I had an on-site contractor 
and Linda loves the story. And he said, uh, I said, get her a hotel room. So he, I don't know what he came back, like the Willard or something. I said, no, we can't do that. Yeah, get something less expensive. So we put Lindo in an O'Connell Lodge in Arlington. <laughs> you know, it's a parking lot. <laughs> I got a lot of grief from that. I still feel bad. But Linda, you're not the only one in this room who I've put in bad hotels on projects. You can talk to Chris. So, yes, <laughs> we still remember to this day. All right. So I this is this was not part of our report, but I you know my topic is are we were we too pessimistic too optimistic. I, I'm sorry, Claudia may not be on the phone because she might have something to say about what I'm going to say about this. But at that time, and for many, for a long time, we thought we were heading to a four to five degree warming, you know, the various, the higher, some of these higher emission scenarios. Analysis that was done about a year and a half ago now suggests that, and it's assuming current policies get implemented, we may skirt about three degrees. And this is relative to pre-industrial. And they're saying, oh, if we do all the pledges and targets, we get it down to two. I'll just say a quick point. And if you had told me 20 years ago, we're going to skirt three degrees, I would have said, wow, we just avoided the big, you know, the big kahuna. That's where we're, you know, we're, we, you know, mission accomplished. I'm not so sure now. I'm not going to say that. But um, it is interesting that, it, that there is some good news in all this that for various reasons, I don't have time to get into that our emissions trajectory still too high, but lower than we thought. So what do we basically get right? This is a gross oversimplification. Chris would have a lot of things, but I would say that there are a number of sectors that we thought they're just gonna be problems. And it's a question of how much, how fast, how much, I don't claim we got that right, but did we get the, when I say right, I mean like, did we get the direction of change right? Okay, that's what I mean. So biodiversity, you know, there will be decreases in biodiversity. Human health, There's not. there might be some benefit some and there's some things like chris and i were talking about it's you know heat stress is it going up or not some data sets suggest yes some say maybe not but we know you know there's gonna be a whole raft of problems coastal resources obviously sea level rise is not a good thing coastal storms water resources drought flood the like you know we kind of know but the uncertainty is very important you know it's things like the magnitude the the the, uh, the speed of the impacts but you know, are they going to be problems? We thought so, yes, and they are turning out to be problems. Whoops, I jumped. I, this, this thing is a little ornery. Okay, what's turned out to be more complicated? I have to admit, you know, I, I, I'm sort of a synthesizer. I don't specialize in a particular sector. I kind of pull it all together. And I have to admit, one of the most fascinating sectors to me has always been terrestrial vegetation because there's so many things going in so many different directions. So you've got the climate effects, you've got carbon fertilization, you know, other changes, human changes, uh, adaptation, and these don't all move you in the same direction and they can lead to different results. So I wanna sort of briefly just by through example to show some of what we thought would happen. So this is some work that was done and you may know some of Dominique Bachelet, Ron Nielsen and others. Um, and Ron says, hello, uh, congratulations. Um, and they worked with the a biogeography model called MAPS, a biogeochemical cycle model that the folks up at, uh, what was it, NREL, the NREL up in Fort Collins uh, developed, Ojima and Paustian and those guys. Um, and what they found, this and this was back, you know, as you can see, well over 20 years ago, a moderate increase in temperature, a couple degrees of warming, produced an increase in vegetation density and carbon sequestration. A larger increase, like three, four, five degrees could yield carbon losses. And I think Ron might have coined the term green up, brown down. And other models found this. I think Jerry Melillo's TEM model, some others found this, um, this sort of notion of that small amount of warming might, you know, get some benefits, larger amounts, you, you start having more issues. We also found this in agriculture. So Cynthia was on yesterday. We did the EPA report, which was a, a domestic study. We then did an international study. Uh, Bill Travis was part of it, looking at rivers. Cynthia and Martin Perry and Gunter Fisher and others, Tom Downing also looked internationally. And so they looked at yield and a modeling of crop yields around the world. They look at grain crops. They looked at climate change impacts, carbon fertilization, local level adaptation, and then the markets sort of, you know, they ran it through a, 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 a market model uh, or a model of uh, global agriculture. 
And what they found, and this is this is relative to 1990, these temperatures. So two degrees get increased production, essentially, variety of reasons. By four degrees, a decrease. So again, very similar to the unmanaged vegetation. Some of the same driving forces, sort of a increased production, tipping um, um, like a parabolic relationship, and then eventually heading heading south. So a number of us, and we've talked about the third assessment report, and O'Leary was there, Bill Easterling, others. Chris, were you at third assessment? Yes, you're also there. And Linda, of course. Some of us worked on this thing, mentioned this burning embers. We were trying to get a sense of what's what level of change in climate would be problems like based on Article 2 of the convention. We said we had to avoid certain adverse impacts. One of the things we looked at is total economic output. And there were some studies by economists like Richard, uh, um, William Nordhaus started it, but Rob Mendelson, Richard Toll, some other, Sam Fankhauser, to try to look at what might be the global benefits or damages from climate change. And there were only a few we looked at, but some of the models suggested, based on results such as what we saw in vegetation, but also energy use and agriculture, there might there could be some net gains at a small amount of warming, but then it would peak. And then things, at you got to a certain point, would go south. Nordhaus didn't find that. So in our conclusions, we said, well, small amount of morning warming, plus or minus a percent or two would GDP, and then and then it would be really negative with more significant amount of warming, like three to four. Um, but okay, so we were optimistic about a sm so-called small amount of warming, a couple degrees, and some of the key drivers: are carbon fertilization, okay, also adaptation you know, which we had a lot of faith in. Um, okay, now here we are, 2024, as I like to say, the future is now. We're seeing, you know, we always thought it was like, we weren't even sure, right? As we pointed out, I forgot who, we weren't even sure, we knew the climate was warming, we weren't sure it was because of human causes. So it was always like, well, it's stable now and in the future. Now we know the climate changing, we know it's, and we're seeing things. In fact. I think in 1999, uh, we're now in this business of noting effects and sort of at the whole science of attribution has taken off. I think in this very room around 1999, it came to a meeting of ecologists who talked about observed impacts, people like Camille Parmesan. That was, I think the first meeting that I came to that you know, was uh, like, wow, we're really seeing things. Um, and obviously this has grown and it's not just you know, biophysical and ecological effects are seeing socioeconomic impacts. So what are we seeing? Um, I should also tell you before I get into this that my my first daughter was born in 1990. The um, Went to see the pediatrician who said, well, she has a life expectancy of about 80 years. I think it's going to be more than that, but um, hope. And uh, I thought, oh, she's going to live to 2070. So she'll be around long enough to see how wrong her father was with all these projections. <laughs> Guess what? I've lived long enough. <laughs> see how how wrong so interesting in terrestrial vegetation and i'll first point you on the right bill anderegg who was a chapter scientist in the fifth assessment board bird now at university of utah they're pretty very important paper in science a few years ago widespread climate induced forest die off has been observed in forests globally you know, releasing large amounts of carbon okay the the bold i've put in these bowls and reducing the size of future forest carbon sink as i understand it it's not clear, you know, the earlier studies had shown there was clear sink going on with, with global vegetation. It, at a minimum, that rate of increase is flattened a little bit. Whether we're actually at a peak, whether it's a, a net source, that's a, my understanding from the ecologists, that's hard to say, but if somebody would care to weigh in, we talked about this last night, I think you agreed. So it's, it's still, but it's not going up the way some of those early models suggested it would. One of the key reasons is fire, okay? Now this is work that actually was done by um, uh, researchers here at the University of Colorado, Virginia Glacius, Jennifer Balch, and our own Bill Travis, who's been in here. And this is just showing the amount of area burned from the late 20th century to the early 21st. And it's gone up dramatically. Some of it forests in the West, grasslands, even in the East, we knew fire would go up. I'm not aware of projections at least back circa 2000, suggesting fire was going to go up this much. I mean, it's the, the direction was right. The magnitude, I think, was wrong. Um, but again, I opened appeals. There are other studies that I'm not aware of. 
And then in agriculture, it's been interesting. So uh, Dave Lobel, let me start you on the right side of this. Dave Lobel is a brilliant statistician, a statistician at Stanford, did some work looking at what's happened to crop production, crop yields from about, it was about um, 1980 to about 2010. And you look at that figure, I don't see the 10, 15, 20% increases. Again, this was with only maybe a degree of warming or so. You know, you don't, you don't even crops like wheat, which are a C3, right, and should benefit. They're not going, now there's lots going on. Ag look, reality is a lot more complicated than mar models. Is that okay to say that here? But, uh, <laughs> you know, and there's lots of things going on, obviously, especially in something like agriculture. But it's, you know, where's where's the benefit? Where's the benefit? I saw that study. I go, hmm, that's interesting. And then we're learning other things about, now we're coming back, bringing it back to Linda, climate and variability. So, you know, a study done in 2019, Lee et al. finding that excessive rainfall leading to rainfall loss, rainfall losses of comparable magnitude to drought also noting that some of these models don't really, they don't really have flooding. They don't do real well at, at picking up the wet conditions. They do drier conditions. We're seeing, and this is something that was just published last week in Science Advan Advances, low at all, I think is, I think it's correct pronunciation, slower moving and longer traveling heat waves. That, some of that work in the theorized now, we're looking at the data and suggesting that we've had uh, significant droughts in the 2010s that led to uh, spikes in, price of grain crops, like uh, uh, the Russian, there was a drought, I think in 2011 in Russia. Um, and, you know, we're getting heat waves. So, so how do we miss this? Um, well, one of the reasons I think is probably a lot of things. Um, we use pretty simple projections. We basically took, and part of it, I remember we did the EPA report and even the international study, we had like 50 projects. I can't remember how many were modeling did not want to make it too complicated because even, even keeping it simple, things got screwed up. We took the GCM simulated about a 30 year period, mid 20th century. We get a 30 year average. They gave, they gave us then a 30 year average simulated average, you know, circa 2060. And we would take the differences and we would combine them with an observed data set. So, you know, if the temperature, and we do it a monthly. So if it said two degrees warmer in February, we'd raise all the observed February temperatures, two degrees, would said 10% wetter. Anytime there was precipitation, you know, we'd make it 10% greater, no change in variability. We also picked 1951 to 80, maybe one of the more benign periods in the 20th century. And so we just changed the average conditions. So that's, a, that's kind of a big deal to have that missing, you know? And, and I think that, and so it, it may be, beside where disturbance and variability are making a big difference, particularly in, in some uh, systems like agriculture. So a lesson I take, and you know, a lot of us, we did things, we did burning embers. You know, we would, you know, people would say, oh, you know, we, look, our models all show this. They're all consistently showing this. Steve Snyder used to refer to that as crackpot rigor, right? And sometimes we do rely too much on, oh, we all found the same thing. But nonetheless, we ran with that and I, you know, a lesson I take, and maybe I'm overreading this, but you know, if you're if you're in a business of projecting impacts, it's nice to look at what you've learned from the modeling. But what did you leave out? And could not only could that affect the magnitude as you would expect, it would could it change the sign? Did you leave out something critical? And I wonder, you know, with variability. Now, constructing scenarios with variability is not an easy thing. I defer to experts like like Linda. Um, so. If I may, I want to tell one more story about Linda. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> there she is. Larger than life. As she is, as you are. So Linda and I, I don't know how many of you have been in this energy modeling forum meetings in snow mass. Yes. And it's always, I mean, there, there's something. They were heady. I was just like I'm honored to be with you. It was honored to be in there. You had very bright people going on about topics and years time to go after them. And it was a lot of fun. Because most conferences, you never, people never have time to go after each other. And we'd sit, we'd sit. So I was sitting once between Linda and John Riley, who many of you know, and a certain individual there uh, who didn't not have a low opinion of himself was giving the, I won't name the name, you can guess, was giving like the fifth talk about the fifth topic and going on. And I sort of muttered under my breath, okay, does this guy sell hot dogs at halftime? And Linda immediately came back and said, no, he'll invent a new hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, uh, 
John and I wanted to dive under the table. We were laughing so hard. So Linda, it's it's been wonderful to be, you know, a colleague and you know, through this venture. I, congratulations on your retirement. I look forward. We we like to get together every now and then. You and Jenny and my wife and I are just you and I just to talk some science and politics, whatever, but it's always uh I look forward to continuing <laughs> our friendship and collaboration. So thanks for letting me speak here. All right. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two questions. And it's busy I'll, I'll, I'll add to your last story for people who oh. haven't had the privilege. This individual was- uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can see they've already figured it out. Highly <laughs> <Yeah. Probably laughs> argumentative. <laughs> Very extremely argumentative. Um, and at one point, moved. Yeah. He's not a native U.S. citizen. Oh, how true! And well, this uh, is discipline. Everything. At one point, moved to Canada. He was what let him back in because they think he's a terrorist, <laughs> which he is, but not for the reason <laughs> they <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'm just curious, anybody see things differently? I mean, I think, you know, there are, there have been, there were modeling attempts with transient scenarios too, but I don't, I think they kind of struggle with capturing the variability. And then there's an initial question about how well is the GCMs in the transient. And certainly like the things that, uh, well, um, Jennifer isn't here, you know, these storms that would come up, I mean, these heat waves, you know, they're a lot, I, you know, very hard, I suspect. Although it'd be interesting to really look hard at the models and see, do what do these things show up at yeah. all? Yeah. So um, going back to our great report, yeah, um, you said a bit about what did we get wrong, but you know there was a lot in that report, um, and maybe you didn't have the time to chance to review it. But did you feel as if the main messages from that report still hold? I think yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, basically the fundamental message: was, Hey, this is going to be a real issue for us to deal with. It's going to be it's serious. You know, and and it is, and in fact, that's gonna. I, it'd be interesting if you'd asked us way back then. When when will we notice the impacts? Mm. I don't think I wouldn't have thought. You know, maybe twenty thirty. I would have thought it would have been much later. Mm -hmm. um, that it would take it. There would be more gradual. And I think one of the, the real the surprises. Well, I'd say so. My take is that the emissions. The good news is the emissions are lower than we thought. The bad news is the impact, I won't say the climate sense, the sensitive system, because that implies climate sensitivity, the impacts, a lot of them are a lot yes. worse. Yeah. They're coming a lot faster, a lot sooner than a lot of us had thought. And that's been like, you know, you read these things like, wow. <laughs> I mean, there's all, you know, the attribution, a lot of things get overstated and we will know that, but it's, um, it's certainly, I didn't, you know, and I'm accused of being too optimistic okay, about some of the stuff. Some people say I'm a, too pessimistic, but I, you know, I, I, I try not to be alarmist, but you know, you look at some of the stuff and you go, like, wow. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. We should, we should move on because we're already running a little oh, bit okay. behind. So, all right. Uh, our next, our next speaker is virtual um, and it is Stefan Rahimi. Yay, yes. Yo, 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 your boat. I'm trying, I'm trying not to be nervous for this because it's um first time, the first time I've ever been in a room with kind of the titans of all of this stuff, uh, all this, you know, the, the intersection of climate and society and uh, policy, all of this, all of this stuff, it's a little overwhelming. So forgive, forgive the nerves. I'll try and dispel them as rapidly as possible. But um, anyways, um, I'm really happy to talk about this. I'm not going to read this. Hopefully the appearance of this tumbleweed in the first slide um, will, will, um, will, the reason I'm using this as kind of a theme of the talk will become apparent shortly. Um, but um, I want to start off by showing some of my mentors, actually, all of these folks have mentored me. Um, you know, I just finished my PhD back in 2019, so I haven't been in the field all that long. Um, and each, there's so many more folks on this slide that, that have given me useful advice or I've, I've idealized their research uh, to some extent. Um, you know, Ruby, uh, Colin, and Paul here um, were really, really helpful at times during my PhD work. Um, where I studied aerosol weather climate interactions using different modeling frameworks. Uh, then I started my postdoc and really pivoted from climate to climate change and regional downscaling and my network grew. Um, but um, 
you know, one thing I want to point out here is the diversity. I, I really am inspired by kind of the diversity that's kind of represented here. Um, as I as I continue to learn about creating these kind of fit for purpose climate projections. Um, and uh, kind of if you dig into the literature, obviously you all know this, you go back and you go back, you go to the early 2000s, the 1990s, and even late 1980s, and you eventually converge uh, on these two these two names, Linda Mearns um, and uh, uh, Filippo Giorgi there on the right. Um, and that's, these, these underpin kind of, um, you know, the main branches of this tumbleweed that has amassed this, what I call the tumbleweed of, of happiness that is that is amassed around regional regional climate projections, uh, tailoring them to stakeholder needs and and, and uh, making them useful for decision making. Um, and I could go through kind of the the CV litany of of accomplishments that Linda has been involved in over the years, but the two that I feel like have been most important for me um, are are in a Cortex, uh, specifically Cortex as an enterprise itself, uh, and then before that, a little bit before that, NARCAP. Um, I think this was intentional, but I don't know. I've never asked Linda or Melissa Bukowski directly about this, but um, these have really been uh, defining institutions for me as a, as, a, as a regional downscaler, particularly in dynamical methods as uh, kind of a, a point of centralization for technique. Um, you know, you have these different modeling groups that uh, particularly in Cortex um, report, you know, their, their RCM setups across uh, different regions of the planet. Uh, it allows me insight into different modeling strategies at, at a very technical level. Uh, so I, I feel like it, it almost provides this, um, this forum for me to guzzle information on, on proper technique. And I, I feel like that's what, uh, at, le at least at this point in my career, I'm really obsessed with is kind of perfecting uh, uh, and improving technique uh, as, uh, so, as much as I can in dynamical downscaling. So um, I really want to just start off by saying that, um, Linda, your initiative uh, and of course, others in your uh, tum tumbleweed of happiness um, has has really shaped my work, and I'm really, really, really thankful for you and and uh, kind of the, the other scientists in your orbit. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, kind of turning to a little bit uh, more 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 science and uh, less bragging about others. Although I could just sit here and brag for like an hour about so many in the room. Um, I am in the business of regional downscaling and um, particularly using dynamical methods. Uh, and um, I, I've, I've kind of become someone who focuses on the issues with downscaling as much as, or even more than uh, kind of its, its strengths over other downscaling techniques. Um, you can see here for one climate model that we've downscaled across the Western US, you go from this nice smooth, uh, you know, precipitation change in the future uh, in the global climate model but then as we downscale the progressively higher uh, resolution, smaller grid spacings, you get, for instance, the geographic complexities of California expressed in the climate change signal. But is it just a pretty picture? And um, I, I'm obsessed with uh, particularly figuring out when I'm just looking at a pretty picture versus whenever I'm uh, you know, looking at something else. And uh, Dave Pierce, inventor of NCView, uh, I like to say, um, he, he always uses this phrase, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I, I would argue that the more biased our, our, our dynamical methods are, the less useful they are, even if they are rooted in physical computations, uh, computational physics, excuse me. So um, one, of, um, one instance I have here is from uh, a data set that I've, I've, I've worked to produce with, with, with many others over the past four years. Um, here, we're looking at precipitation at Denver, Colorado uh, from observations. Uh, and then one of our uh, well-vetted global climate models from CMIP-6, uh, this is uh, the dash line, and this is native GCM precip. Um, so no downscaling involved, but you can see it's like 50 to 100% wet biased, just the native GCM. And so it's kind of like, well, um, the GCM is uh, biased, but we're gonna downscale it. We're gonna fix its issues now. Um, that's what we get whenever we downscale the red line. Um, and you can see it's even more biased than the parent GCM. And um, I must admit, when I first got into dynamically downscaling GCMs, I was convinced the first time I downscaled CSM2, another uh, well-performing GCM across the Western United States in terms of uh, you know, process-based metrics, um, I was convinced I'd done something wrong. And um, 
uh, as I moved deeper into downscaling GCMs, I kind of, you know, immersed myself in the downscaling literature and figured out that, oh, wow, bias adjustment is very, very common practice in, um, in, in downscaling. Um, and of course, you all know this, but, um, you know, we just basically replaced the means of uh, a, a GCM or downscale GCM's time series to, and we force it, uh, we force that uh, its statistics to match observations. And so that's, that, that, that's kind of like artificial, almost like sucking on a dirty coin. It just puts a bad taste in my mouth. So um, I understand it's, it's ubiquitous, it's need for it, the need for its application. Um, and um, just as a preface um, to what I'm about to go into next, um, whenever we started to develop our downscale data set uh, across the Western United States, I was told um, originally when we were providing four initial global climate model projections to the uh, fifth California climate assessment, um, no bias correction, don't touch it, uh, don't play around with it because we're concerned about how climate trends uh, will, be, will be altered or how much uncertainty we may introduce into the projection. More on that later. Uh, but anyways, my a core thrust of my research has um, kind of uh, gone deeper into technique and confronted the controversy around bias adjustment uh, head on. Um, and so before I get into that, um, just a, a word, um, you know, um, and this kind of stems from, from everything that Cortex was, or everything that Cortex is and everything that NARCAP was, um, downscaling one global climate model or two or three or even four doesn't seem like enough. We need more, we need more, we need more. And so um, my postdoc supervisor and mentor, Alex Hall, kind of gave me wide latitude to just downscale as much as I could. Um, and so this culminated in this uh, data set uh, here with 15 GCMs downscaled um, over the past four years or so. Uh, but it's not just 15. We actually ran twin experiments of these same 15, but with a pre-downscaling bias adjustment of the mean state fields following um, some really fantastic work uh, from about a decade ago of Cindy Briere and uh, Dan Steinhoff et al. And um, Dave Pierce also, and others who implement bias correction, by the way, uh, like to say the more you have to use bias correction or the more invasive the bias correction procedure is, the less useful it is. Um, so we adopted, you know, like the Briere, we like the Briere et al approach because um, we only bias corrected the climate means um, of fields that were bias corrected. Um, and so, um, we, and we only did this to, you know, five fields uh, that go into the regional climate model, the horizontal winds, SSTs, uh, temperature and Q. And the impacts of this um, on the historical climatologies were um, looking at panels A and C here, um, that these, it's interesting in nine GCM mean here, um, these GCMs are all cold biased and wet biased. When we biased adjust and then downscale, boom, we reduce these biases, perhaps an expected result. Um, and um, we see the same thing show up in cumulative precipitation at, at Western US uh, snow tail sites. Uh, and we see this also uh, for snow water equivalent, uh, this reduction in bias. Um, additionally, we see an improvement in the extremes. Uh, particularly, um, we see these blue bars here, which are uh, the non-bias adjusted simulations um, they're much too wet uh, whenever it comes to uh, simulating these longer duration, these 10, 20, and 30 day extreme uh, precipitation events um, relative to the black bar observations. And then of course their pair of GCMs, the yellow. Um, but when we biased adjust and then downscale, we're, we're doing a lot better in terms of representing these extrema. So in other words, we're bias correcting the means, bias adjusting the means. I got can canned by a reviewer recently for that. Um, uh, was it you, Linda? Uh, no, no, just kidding. Um, but, um, you know, it's we're bias adjusting the means, but we're getting improvements in the extrema as well, which is really nice to see. But um, unlike uh, some other bias adjustment techniques out there, because we're doing this in a dynamical framework, which uses the equations of uh, the governing primitive equations uh, to solve for atmospheric motions, um, we can look at GCM bias here. And that's what this, this figure is showing specifically for temperature. We're looking at a region averaged across the Northeastern Pacific and Western US. Um, these are native, this is G, native GCM information only. And we can see that uh, for CMIP6 GCMs, uh, there are 30 comprising the spread here. Uh, and then the black solid line shows um, the, the, the ensemble mean. It's amazing to me that, that most CMIP6 uh, GCMs, at least the ones plotted here, are, are all too cold relative to uh, a historical reanalysis. Um, with a low level instability bias. And so um, using fundamental meteorological principles, we can kind of relate 
this colder atmosphere in GCMs to uh, um, uh, an atmosphere that is more conducive to heterogeneous nucleation processes, which of course uh, increase precipitation efficiency. Uh, instability, particularly the low levels, um, increases your convective available potential energy, more upward vertical velocities, more precipitation that way. Um, and how we're bias correcting as well, even though this is only a mean state approach um, in which we're bias correcting, we're also bias correcting for the geometry of bias because this bias correction is, is, um, is grid point specific. And if we look at how our uh, GCMs are biased in space, we can see this cyclonic vorticity bias that exists in CMIP class GCMs currently. And so you can kind of imagine if this bias, since it is embedded in the westerlies, if we transmit this to the regional climate model, you know, thinking back to fundamental quasi-geostrophic principles, you know, cyclonic vorticity advection is directly coupled diagnostically to upward vertical velocities, which of course means more precipitation. So this begins to explain why we're seeing this overly wet behavior uh, in our wharf simulations. And by the way, in unnudged RegCM experiments published last year, they found a very similar behavior um, uh, to this wharf ensemble. So uh, it's, it's good to see that, um, that, that, that the results seem to be consistent even amongst uh, you know, different RCMs downscaling rel uh, some overlapping GCMs. But um, we don't downscale just to uh, look at the historical climate. We are interested in how bias adjustment may impact future trends. So there's a lot of information on this. So put concisely, um, we took the future change signal, both for temperature, precipitation, and snow water equivalent, and we plotted it against historical GCM bias. Uh, for the bias corrected experiments, which are the uh, hollowed out circles, and lines connect them to their non-bias adjusted counterparts. And so in each one of these, both for temperature, precip, and snow, the biases are reduced. Uh, the solid circles are closer to the zero line. However, the y-axis, which is showing the, uh, the, ver the future change signal, um, we don't want to see too much distortion of the, of the future change signal um, as a result of, of bias adjustment. We don't want to see these lines deviate from the horizontal. And indeed, when averaged across the western US, we don't really see that for temperature. We see it in a few cases for precipitation. However, we really see it for snow. Bias adjustment is modifying uh, the change signal uh, for this state-dependent variable. But this begs the question, and this goes back to a figure I showed earlier. Um, since snow water equivalent, equivalent is, um, is, is very, very biased without any bias adjustment applied to the GCM boundary conditions, is it a fair to use the original SWE as a benchmark for quantifying uncertainty? And that's just a question. I don't have a good answer for it. My, my, my intuition is no. Um, and when we, indeed, when we make these Hawkins and Sutton style diagrams showing the internal variability uh, contribution to uncertainty, uh, the GCM selection uh, to uncertainty, and then we put bias correction in here as this red sliver, uh, we see you know, effectively what those previous figures were, were just showing. That bias correction is really not introducing all that much uncertainty for, uh, for temperature and precipitation. We've made these for other seasons as well. Um, but for snow, um, it can become a dominant source, source of uncertainty. Again, we're not, plot, we're not showing scenario uncertainty just because we didn't run alternate emission scenarios in our future runs. Um, but anyways, so um, I won't show that in the interest of time. Uh, but getting back to um, kind of ideas of technique and, and always looking for ways to improve our downscaling approach, uh, one recent thing, one, one recent item of, of improvement is GCMs uh, in CMIP, uh, CMIP class GCMs, even the high res MIP simulations, do not capture, for instance, Gulf of California SSTs. Um, and this is very important when you consider that the uh, warmness of the Gulf of California SSTs uh, is really critical for modulating monsoonal disturbance intensity. Um, and so uh, what we've done is effectively um, looked at uh, historical um, climatologies of SSTs in the Gulf of California, uh, and then here is the uh, historical climatologies of SSTs um, in the adjacent Pacific, which are usually in regional models just extrapolated into uh, the Gulf of California, which is quite incorrect. Um, and we basically built a linear function to extrapolate more realistically uh, the, the SSTs in the Gulf of California relating uh, the, the Gulf of California uh, SSTs to the, uh, the entry region temperatures, which are resolved in global climate models. Uh, so just little tricks like this, trying to improve kind of, you know, downscaling technique, you know, RCMs and GCMs, they don't necessarily speak the same language. And so we view these kind of 
uh, whether it's bias correction or these little tricks to increase um, you know, model skill as a kind of translation mechanisms um, between GCMs and RCMs to kind of come, come produce a better uh, climate set of climate data outputs. Um, so more work needs to be done in this space. And I want to tie this back into um, kind of uh, what I've said at the beginning about kind of the tumbleweed, but scientifically, um, and we saw uh, a description of this uh, in Melissa's talk uh, and others, but uh, more intercomparisons needs to be made between different climate data sets, both statistical and dynamical uh, as well. And this is something I really feel strongly about item two, um, more deliberate and well-documented model testing. These don't need to just be sections of papers. Um, we, you know, we're in, we need to think of ourselves as you know, climate data engineers um, le uh, rather than you know, academic climate data producers, um, because people are actually using these data for, for risk assessments, you know, and, um, and you know, I, I, I fairly far too often see like bias evaluations and model testing, uh, you know, choices comprise very small segments of, of very large papers. And I think, I think, uh, this could, this could stand to be ex uh, expanded. Um, and then in line with kind of the Cortex mission and, and that of NARCAP, uh, we don't need to just downscale more GCMs. We need to use more RCMs to downscale more GCMs. Um, I think compute power is starting to allow for this, um, but this requires coordination. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll conclude with this, and thank you for letting me go slightly over on time. Um, where I see opportunities, and I'm gonna get, get all philosophical on y'all, I'm sorry. Um, I see our greatest strengths coming in the form of openness and sharing. We saw this around the response to the pandemic, different federal agencies and, and otherwise lowered their uh, guardrails to, and shared information. We were able to produce quick vaccines. Um, and um, I see, I think, I know in my heart that the same thing goes for climate data. Uh, so that, whether that means that, you know, you produce a data set, even if it's not published, don't be, don't be afraid to share those data with, with your partners and colleagues, like let them help you sift through this ever more increasing terabytes, petabyte scale data flow, um, supporting each other rather than under, undercutting each other. Um, really, really, um, this, that kind of ties into one. Uh, but finally, um, three, embracing diversity. Um, again, that initial slide I showed really shows kind of uh, at least my inner tumbleweed uh, or inner network tumbleweed of mentors. Uh, I think there's a fair degree of diversity there. Um, and um, yeah, I, that's, that's pretty much all I have. But I just want to conclude by uh, saying thank you so much, Linda. Um, I've really valued some of the lunch chats we've had over the last uh, couple of years. Again, I feel a little bit presumptu presumptuous uh, giving such a talk, but um, you're a mentor to so many, including myself, and uh, say hello to Crispin and Theo for me. Thank you. Hey, we don't have very long questions, but I know that Linda has a very important question. If you want to, if you want to bring back up the first slide of your presentation. Uh oh. <laughs> Goodness. By the way, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm sorry. By the way, hold on a sec, really quick. Does he not have the friendliest face you've ever seen in your life? Anyways, okay. This one or this one? No, no, the first one. There we go. Okay, your kitties. Yes. What are their names? What um, names? This, the Siamese with neck rolls, that is ube, like the potato. <laughs> and the one on the right is Sergeant Butter. <laughs> Excellent. So, all right. It looks a lot like the... Uh... All right, now that we've got the important questions out of the way, we have time for probably one scientific question. Doug. <clears throat> Thanks, I, I enjoyed your talk. Um, if you if you go back to the slide where you were talking about extremes, maybe yes. um, maybe I, I didn't read it right, but it looked like the GCMs were actually closer to the black lines than the RCMs. In every case, yes. yes. Um, and so this is this was actually a surprising result to me. I had always heard that GCMs were quite bad at extremes, particularly for precipitation, but. No, you're right. But I will say this is an average taken across California, which is a huge, huge state. Uh, and so I think there might be there. It might this might be a kind of an artifact of our, you know, our, us considering an average over a rather large area. I mean, if you look more at local scales, 
the divergence between uh, observations and the GCMs can be, the native GCMs can be huge. Thank you very much. Um, and now our final speaker uh, is Barb Brown. So I'm gonna talk about women in atmospheric sciences and statistical applications to climate. And I, I had the good fortune to actually do work with Linda on a couple on these things, but unfortunately I really only worked with you until I moved to RAL, which was in 1992. So sadly, um, everything I'm gonna be talking about was before 1992. <laughs> so, um, but Linda and I have both been here at NCAR for almost the same amount of time, I think. So a long time. So I'll be talking about Women in Atmospheric Sciences, which was a group that was initiated by a group of women at NCAR. It became a, a group um, across Boulder, among all the labs in Boulder. And um, what what that organization was all about, why it happened, um, and then some changes and to policy at NCAR and UCAR um, and that, that followed that. And then a little bit of some research, the only research project <laughs> that I worked on with Linda. <laughs> um, there's a good reason. I know, but there's a good, there's a good reason to revisit it. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, I, I was involved in, the, in 1989 in, a, in helping doing a statistical analysis of um, staff at, M, at NCAR. And I, I pulled this out of, I, I am one of these people, I think like Linda who keeps everything. So I, I have piles of stuff that I went through before I can, uh, put this talk together. Um, but this was a survey that was done by HR and that, that I helped with um, showing the breakdown of women and men at, at NCAR and the numbers. And you can see they, they had to group the associate scientists with somebody else because mm -hmm. I guess both programmers and scientists had too small of a group to be handled by themselves. So they got grouped in with the associate scientists, but you can see that the number of women was way smaller than the number of men at NCAR at that time in science, in technical positions. And, but at the same time, I think during this period, a number of women started um, to work as scientists. It was, became more of a boom for, for women to be in this profession. And, um, and because these were young scientists, some of them um, were starting families and had children and also had partners who worked. So, and um, a few of us recognized that some of the NCAR policies didn't really fit with this evolution and the change in the workplace and, you know, things like maternity leave. So, I think there, there were a group of us who became activists at NCAR. Um, Linda was among us. Um, she was, a, in fact, quite a big leader of the whole project, the whole, whole effort. Um, myself, Mary Downton, Beth Holland, Pascal Lelong, and Kathy Miller were also a part of this. And I think I remember this whole thing started when some of us just happened to be standing in the hallway talking about things. And that's one of the things that can happen when people are talking in the hallway. And some of the things that were, were disturbing, I think, especially to the women scientists at NCAR was that there, were, there, were no, there was no ability to stop the clock if you were gonna go up for tenure, if you were a senior, if you were aiming to get on, you know, move up the scientist's ladder. You, didn't, you had to do it within a certain amount of time or I don't know what happened to you if you didn't do it. You just, I guess you're up or out, that's right. Um, we also, there wasn't really much recognition that people had babies. And so they might need to be pumping milk during the day while they were at work. So I would go down to the basement in SCD, science, scientific computing division at the time and hide in the last stall in the bathroom. It was awful. Um, children weren't welcome in the workplace in general. Um, and uh, part of this was 
part of this effort that we came up with was that one of the women scientists, I think she was a scientist one at the time, got in trouble because she had her baby in, in her office with her. And then the policy read for what kind of leave you got for pregnancy or post-pregnancy. And those that that kind of leave was in the in the manual, the the rules manual, <laughs> treated as the same manner as any other illness or accident and limited totally to medical necessity. So in other words, you couldn't um, take, just take time off because you wanted to spend time with your baby. Um, and your partner could not do that. Men were not included in this at all. So, so we, you know, kind of, we, we went through a lot of a lot of things trying to trying to figure out what the best way to, was to go about this. And we eventually wrote a memorandum to the NCAR director that was signed by 23 staff members, including both men and women and all the scientist levels. And we outlined those issues um, and asked also for the um, creation of a council on family work, family, family and work that would kind of keep an eye on these things and try to keep moving things forward. Also, there was a request for flexible leave op options, especially for things like pregnancy. But, um, and at the same time, this, this expanded well beyond NCAR into all of the NOAA labs at, um, in Boulder. And it brought women, a lot of women across Boulder together to discuss science. And you can see from the NCAR numbers that we were a pretty small number in the in the community here. And that was true, I think, in the NOAA labs as well. So they were feeling the same kinds of things that we were. And so we created this organization. And I have no idea who created the logo. Do you remember Linda? <laughs> it was called, we called it We As, but Women in Atmospheric Sciences. And in, in addition to trying to you know, move things forward, it was an opportunity for us to get to know each other and, and to share our knowledge and our experiences. So that it was wonderful that it expanded that broadly. And amazingly enough, um, things changed. So um, we, we sent this memorandum and I think that that had a big impact on, on Bob Serafin. And um, so 1992 is when the new new policies were implemented and they we were even getting given credit for it. <laughs> that um, a proposal prepared by we as the Women in Atmospheric Science and supported by many staff was the catalyst for mm -hmm. this review of, of practices. And so activism works. This is, you know, the main occurrence in my life where I've seen activism really <laughs> You know, make a change. So there were changes in work and family, flexible work, scientific appointments, leaves of absence, dependent care assistance. And just as a couple of examples, we, this is, these appeared in staff notes um, back in 1992, the scientific ap appointments policy allowed you to slow the clock. Um, and when you're, you couldn't, you know, if you needed needed the time for having a child or um, other reasons, you can stop stop the clock or or so delay delay going up to to the next level. It also provided more um, leave options, including family leave, family care leave. So it's not just about taking care of your children. It also did a did form a. Council on Family and Work and created dependent care assistance program for people to put money away um, to, to, get, to get help. So the Council on Family and Work was established in 1992. Um, we did surveys in 1994 and um, you know, a staff survey in 1994, and I, I can't remember what APS stands. Oh, Applied Physics. American Physical Society, thank you. <laughs> I knew that, but <laughs> I lost it. And um, those two surveys um, address some similar issues, um, but also some different ones, including the adequacy of sick leave and family leave, family sick leave. Unfortunately, the Council on Family and Work um, is no longer in place. 
um, and I don't, it didn't last probably into the, into the 2000s actually. Um, and, but one, one other change that has finally happened and happened uh, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that the NCAR is now has a, an affiliation with the child care center, which was one of the big requests that people had. Um, and I, I know a number of people that that's really helped. So, is that right? Uh, that's a really big deal. <laughs> yeah, that's that's too bad. So maybe somebody needs to stand up and fight for that. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, I, I didn't know the status of it, so I'm glad to hear that, Rachel. It still exists, but it's not like much. Yeah. So I want to compare that figure that I showed earlier to what I got as a snapshot. And I want to thank Liz a lot of lot for helping me with HR to get the numbers on the bottom, the 2024 snapshot. And they're not equivalent, but I think that big thing is just looking at the two col the columns for females in the two tables and you can see how dramatically it's changed um you know that may have taken 30 years but <laughs> it's better than it, it's way better than it used to be so that's that's really good so in 1989 the total number in the in these tables were about 14% and in 2024 41% for associate scientists and scientists. So, all right. So that's all I had to say about that. <laughs> so I'm gonna move on to a short discussion of a project that Linda and I worked on and, and Rick. And, uh, you know, we didn't, I, I moved to RAL in 1990 and I had no more time. I had two small children at home. I was working full time and I always apologized to Linda. Every time she came up to me and said, you know, we got to finish that project. <laughs> and then it became joking about, we got to finish that project. Ha ha ha. When did, that's the, when did it become a joke? Well, I think you made it a joke. At least you were laughing at the time, sometime in there. <laughs> so and I, you know, I want to present this too because I think there might be, you know, possibilities that we could revisit it now that we're retired and Rick is retired. We can we can do that. So, um, uh, so this was part of a, a 1990s NOAA funded project that we did. It was actually joint with NOAA FSO. I don't know why that's there. Okay. 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 There we go. Um, so we worked at. at colleagues with um, at, at NOAA GSD. And the project was on precipitation variability and extreme events, implications for climate models and climate change. And it had three major components. Um, the first one was um, organized by the, some of the NOAA folks on just looking at the data that we could get and doing an assessment. Um, Katz and Perlange did some work on, on stochastic modeling of time series. I think you probably published that, right, Rick? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and um, then a model, model validation and spatial aggregation project that Linda did with, with Larry. And, uh, and then the, the last project is the one I'm going to show some, some results about of, <laughs> Um, which is the part that I think we should we should finish up. Linda, it's um, Linda and me and Larry and Rick, Rick were involved in this, looking at model generated precipitation um, in Iowa and looking at temporal and spatial scaring spatial characteristics. <laughs> so, and why aren't we moving now? I have to go down here, I guess. Um. So uh, this was a spatial st scaling study using RegCM. I don't remember what the scaling of, of that was. I should remember. Yeah, it's down there. Okay, um, 60 kilometer resolution. So it was not 
you know, even though it was a regional model, it was 60, 60 kilometers. And the goal was to gain an understanding of spatial scaling characteristics of summer precipitation fields on short time scales. And so we wanted to test the concept that Iowa precipitation um, fields could be characterized by simple scaling and to evaluate the realism of the scaling, comparing the model fields to the observed fields from 88 precipitation. So it was a nice little part partnering between statisticians and atmospheric scientists. And I have to give credit to Rick for actually coming up with the basic ideas for this project. Um, again, the observations were, were from, well, the observations were from the, what was called the hourly precipitation gauge data set from NOAA, and we had 88 stations, and I'll show that map in a minute. And then, as I said, the REGCM. Um, so the goals were to evaluate the type of spatial scaling that characterizes the observation and model-based values and compare statistics of the modeled and observed grids. So we wanted to see how well spatial scaling attributes were how, how how similar they were between the observations and the, and the model. And so this might, I guess it's not too hard to read. You can see that our gauge, our gauge stations are not, you know, they're not a lot, but they're Iowa's, I think that we chose Iowa because Iowa is better than any place else <laughs> in the in terms of the number of gauges. <laughs> not in a general sense, but um, and this is the finest resolution. So we looked at, let me just say this, this is, this is the, the box size index. So we were, <laughs> let me see if I can see that. This is the finest resolution so of, of, the, of the model. Um, so we had um, grid sizes of 2,326 kilometers squared was our, our our smallest size. Uh, you're not supposed to go yet. Um, so basically, we divided the, the state of Iowa into boxes, and then we put different, uh, looked at different scales and looked at how um, the characteristics of the scaling, the characteristics of the precipitation averages um, f function as, as a, as um, what the, and I'm not saying this quite right. We wanted to compare the, the spatial scaling to how well the, let me just go to the next slide. <laughs> this is easier. So it, looked, it, it turns out according to, and I don't know if I mentioned it, was, this was based on a, a work by um, Harlange and Weymeyer, Gupta and Weymeyer, right? And uh, you can tell I haven't talked about this for a couple of decades. <laughs> but what they had found, Gupta and Weymeyer had found that as you do spatial scaling in this log fashion, where you're looking at the log of the moment versus what's called log lambda. And log lambda is, um, lambda is here. So we're looking at all, at just one box and then down to um, the smallest box, smallest set of boxes. So lambda, is a function of the scale that we're looking at when we divide the, the grid up. And log lambda, and theoretically by, um, through work by Weymeyer, Gupta and Weymeyer, um, it, it is a simple scaling if you get a linear, linear connection between um, log lambda and log, log of the moment. So this is, these are the results from the data that we had and you can see that that we did get that nice linear linear structure, so that there really was um, a connection in the in this simple simple scaling idea between the observation between the um, the scale and the and the average precipitation the precipitation moments. Um, but we do see also that the model scaling is quite different from the observed. And basically it underestimated, the model underestimated the amount of precipitation, which you can see here and looking at one of, looking at the observed versus the model precipitation values. So one reason we should go back and do this is we probably have better model data. <laughs> and uh, this was, you know, it was, it was very enlightening 
but um, we probably need to do, you know, we, we could look at it again. So what did we learn? We learned that from this simple criterion, summer precipitation, at least in a place like Iowa, which has fairly simple topography and a fair number of, of stations, that simple scaling, the simple scaling idea is um, reasonable for both the observed and observations in the model. But a second criterion that I'm not gonna talk about here doesn't hold, so. Um, and um, this seemed like a nice alternative way to, to evaluate models. I think that's one thing that came out of this study. And um, I think the, the really nice thing is that basically the spatial organization of the precipitation, even for this older model, was um, pretty similar. So um, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but I'm going to do something to embarrass Linda. <laughs> no, in a kind way. I'm just telling you that. I, I have... I have, um, I, this is my tribute instead of actually giving a tribute. So, so I, I found this, this poem, some closing words. It's hard, it's a hard time to be human. We know too much and too little. Does the breeze need us, the cliffs, the gulls? Does anybody need us? Mm -hmm. If you've managed to do one good thing, the ocean doesn't care. But when Newton's apple fell toward the earth, the earth ever so slightly fell toward the apple as well. So Linda, the earth has moved toward you. <laughs> I think seriously, I'm listening to all the talks this week. It's been incredible and um, how much impact you've had on our world. And it may be not the whole earth, but it's our world. It's had a huge impact on, and I think probably bigger than that. So that's, um, that's all I have. That is it for speakers. I need a microphone though. <laughs> okay. Um, and so now we have we have tributes. Um, we're running a little bit behind. So in the interest of time, I've got a couple written ones here from Chris Castro and Richard Jones that I will hold till later. Um, so that we can get the tributes from uh, people who yeah. have signed up to do uh, live ones. And I believe the first person we have is Brian O'Neill, uh, oh, wow. who's virtual. If you're online, Brian. Okay, great. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Linda, especially. Hello from Maryland. Um, I just want to take this short opportunity here to say thank you for a few things. And first, of course, that starts with uh, you're hiring me um, at NCAR in 2008. Um, I was at the time returning from five or six years in Europe and uh, looking for a place to land in the US. Uh, and I was really glad to have the opportunity to join NCAR and particularly ISSI, the, the Institute for Study of Society and Environment, which you were running at the time. Uh, and that um, started off my my 10 year stay uh, at the Institute, uh, thanks to that uh, opportunity from you. Um, second is, is really just for your support, general support of all kinds for interdisciplinary work. Um, and I, I know that was before I got there. Uh, it was definitely while I was there and I'm betting uh, that it has continued um, after I left. And I think mm -hmm. that um, Interdisciplinary work really only works when there are individuals who really want to do it and who are really excited about it. I mean, you need all the the right institutional structure and all that, but but the greatest structure is not going to produce anything if you don't have people excited to do the work. So your support for that and your excitement about it um, was was really uh, a great benefit. Um, and third. Um, for improving my vocabulary. Um, I probably many of you have had the experience of picking up new words uh, from Linda from time to time. She has an expansive vocabulary, is not afraid to use it. Um, the, the last word I learned from you, I believe, was the one Claudia used earlier today, um, perspicacious. Uh, and so I, um, I 
thank you for improving my um, <laughs> uh, articulateness, uh, I guess. Um, and uh, and finally, I guess for your 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 insight, um, I, I I won't now use the word perspicacity, but but <laughs> perspicacity um, in over uh, over the time that I was there um, in in frequently asking questions or making an observation, uh, whether it was in a, a conversation, a meeting or, or a seminar that really made us rethink what we were doing, look at things from a new perspective and really, really helped move things along. So many thanks uh, and enjoy your retirement. Next up, we have Mari Tai, um, and we're gonna have people come down here to the front, but we're using the, the room mics, so you don't need to. You don't need to put the microphone on or anything. Hi, I'm Mari Tai. I'm in the Climate and Global Dynamics Lab. And well, in 2008, when I started my PhD, I am afraid I haven't heard of Linda. And I realized that I actually have a, a great deal to thank you for because I rather terrified my supervisor, Haley Fowler. One of the first things that I said to her was, I don't like climate models. I don't think any models are useful, and I'm not going to do this. Um, and <laughs> essentially, we came in from completely the opposite direction of a lot of talks we've come from, where uh, I represented the, the other side, the, the dark side of the room, the civil engineers who didn't want anything to do with climate models and needed to be kind of encouraged towards maybe talking a little bit more to the atmospheric sciences and understanding a bit more. And when I came here eventually in 2012, um, we sort of, we walked, worked more alongside each other rather than together. And we had, do have a, a zombie paper that might join the <laughs> collection um, eventually. So I, you know, I, I have to thank you for, for really just inspiring me through that part of my career where we've, we've worked parallelly, but not together. Um, but really in the last two or three years, I've had this great opportunity to work with Linda on the conference of parties in the, and she gave me the opportunity to attend COP in Sharm El Sheikh um, a couple of years ago, and then again to go to Dubai last year. And I have just learned so much more about the, the behemoth of, <laughs> UNFCCC and what goes into how we translate and people use and misuse climate science to their, to their how they, they wish to use it. Um, and I, yeah, I just thank you for the opportunity to work with you on, in so many different, different capacities. All right, Rob Lambert. Oh, huh. yes. Yes. Hi, Linda. Um, yeah, so um, uh, first off, I mean, thank you all for putting together this conference. I mean, it's it's been really amazing to, to see and be reminded of the, the breadth of, of Linda's accomplishments. Um, you know, I, I just want to, you know, recapitulate some of the, the just all the things that people have mentioned that, you know, Linda's inspiring passion for interdip interdisciplinarity, um, Focusing on decisions I and mean, what the information is useful, useful for, her, her great questions, um, her clarity about what we know, what we don't know, how to act based upon that. Um, two other attributes I, I with I, I haven't heard it mentioned as as much is, um, you know, first off, um, Linda's um, wonderful honesty. I mean, I've there there are. I've had occasions with with other people when uh, you know I, I've been volunteered for stuff, and I say mm, that doesn't sound so interesting, so fun, and it seems like a lot of work. And they say, no, no, it'll be really interesting, really fun, and not a lot of work. And then you volunteer, and then they disappear because it's too much work and no fun. Um, and, <laughs> um, Linda's never like that, you know. If Linda says, "Come, come, come, do this with me," you know, she she is there. She she is in always in deeper than you are, which is uh, which is wonderful. And then Linda is also, um, I mean, a real inspiration in how fearless she can be. I mean, I I've I've been in 
you know, so many meetings where, um, you know, it's, it's descending into groupthink or, you know, some, you know, revered uh, person in the field is saying something and Linda will, you know, everyone's going, mm -hmm. and Linda will stand up often with her, her, her big hat on and say, um, let me ask you about that. And, uh, you know, sort of take the meeting and steer it off in a, in, in a totally different and, and much better direction. And so I just uh, sort of innumerable instances of that. So I um, want to thank her for all that. want to thank her for the inspiration, for the opportunities, uh, mentorship, being such a great colleague. Um, and then uh, turning to the zombie topic, yes, we'll get the zombie book done. And <laughs> And 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 then to but 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 to, to kind of delve even deeper into zombiedom. I don't know, Linda, if you remember that long lost paper we were working on with Camille Parmesan. Oh um, yes, and, yeah, it it is resurrected, and I'm going to be sending you a draft of that next week. <laughs> <laughs> and it's much older than the book. Anyway, thank you so much. Sorry I couldn't join you in person. Mark Morrison. All right, so uh, as Seth just said, I'm uh, Monica Ingram Morrison. I'm a project specialist in the Climate Global Dynamics Lab here in the Mesa Lab, um, and I'm actually a philosopher of science. And so the tribute that I give to Linda today is on behalf of the group of philosophers of science um, under the uh, mentorship of Elizabeth Lloyd from Indiana University um, that Linda was nice enough to adopt um, as part of her uh, research group for many summers. And so this first part is from Lisa and then the rest is from um, the students and postdocs um, that you have welcomed over the years. So uh, Lisa would like me to say that I never would have gone into philosophy of climate science and had a third career if it weren't for Linda, who invited me, laid the path and made it possible. She introduced me to countless folks, taught me most of what I know and we did some fun philosophy together, which was a real thrill. She is the best, a true collaborator and a true interdisciplinary worker. I raise a glass to a fantastic scientist today with all of you there, Elizabeth Lloyd. Um, and with that, I would say that for the students and postdocs that were part of Lloyd Lab, had you not helped Lisa um, pave her third career, we also would have been in very different places than we currently are. Um, as Lisa made it a key feature of her visit to try and include all of us, and you welcomed all of us, so that rather than being a typical philosopher, um, even philosopher of science, um, rather than sitting in our armchairs and studying things from a distance, um, we were actually exposed and immersed in the type of um, science we were doing philosophy of. Um, and personally, it was in 2016 or 2017, I can't actually remember much prior to COVID, <laughs> um, but, uh, that I was set up for my career that I currently have at NCAR, and it was Linda and many others in this room, Seth, Doug Michka, Melissa Bukowski, um, who welcomed me and exercised what I might characterize as extreme patience um, through many conversations um, as I figured out the language and the details of climate modeling. Um, and I also perhaps personally should thank the same group of people for my current obsession with Earth System Models fitness or adequacy for purpose or perhaps lack thereof. Um, and so Linda, we thank you for your open-mindedness, your acceptance of philosophers and all our disagreeable traits, like digging our heels in when someone such as you tells us that we're actually wrong. Um, and for your continued role as an informal mentor and role model. Um, thank you, and we can't express how grateful we are for having you open doors for us and helping us to keep them open. And I will also add that uh, I also thank you for your use of the word epistemic. Um, <laughs> as most people in climate science have told me in my presentations to stay away from that word. Um, but now I can say if Linda Burns does it, I will have to as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Angie Seth, online. Oh, God, Angie. <laughs> cool. There she is. No, she's changed. <laughs> she's not like Rob. 
I'm here. Can you believe it? Hi, everybody. It's so Hi. great to see some of the people. I can spot a few people in the audience. I saw Christine and <laughs> Rachel and Melissa and others. So um, I am so excited to be here. And I know it's going to be really short. And I wish I could have been there with you. But I just want to say thank you for everything. I don't have prepared a prepared tribute. Can you imagine? Um, but I did think a little bit about, well, you know, it would take a long time to think about all the different um, times we have spent together and work, including including work and fun and mentoring mostly of you to me. But um, the, the things I want to thank you most for are really well i have i have to this is going to be less about climate science and more about geography because as linda knows many of you may not but i am um in a geography department at the university of connecticut and linda has been my primary mentor in geography and this shouldn't be surprising i mean we've talked a lot about her interdisciplinarity and and I think that geographic training in her PhD was really, I mean, it's inherent to who she is, but she also was trained that way. And so um, I have been learning so much uh, in the discipline of geography and also from Linda through geography. And I wanna thank you for all your help in, in getting me um, situated, although I'm still a wannabe. I'm still a geography <laughs> wannabe. I'm working on it. Um, and the other thing that I really want to thank you for is your help um, with the Yukon at COP program. Linda has been um, doing the UCAR, um UNFCCC meetings, running the that program for a while. And so um, she's been really helpful at, at helping us bring students to the COP every year. So we've been going since Paris. And that's one of the, the more frequent times that I've seen Linda in the past few years. So thank you so much for that. And anytime you want to come to a UConn women's basketball game, you just let me know. <laughs> work that out <laughs> and I'll try not to kill you with a spicy meal. <laughs> Congratulations. And I know you're not going to totally retire, but I hope you have some good rest. Amanda? Amanda? Oh, Amanda. <laughs> I'm still back here. Um, so yeah, yesterday I talked about climate, uh, climate science and, I, you know, but what we've heard about over the last couple of days, which I think is so critical, is climate science is really, really important and it's hardly ever the most important thing. And, um, you know, for me, when I think about Linda, all of this great impact she's had in her career is not the most important thing to me. The most important thing to me is all of the other things that I've shared uh, with Linda our apparently weird Catholic dedication to both dogs and cats. <laughs> or, um, the fact that, you know, you happily embraced my crazy children um, in a way that, you know, I, I think most other people think they're too weird. Um, I, the, the way you've taught me not to take myself quite so seriously, which is, you know, work in progress. Um, all of those things. And, and, um, but also, and, and this has not come up in the last two days, and so I kind of felt I had to say it, I can't think of Linda. I think of Linda and Jenya, Jenya and Linda. They are, they are themselves, and they are such a part of my life and, and so important. And so what I would like to do, actually, is uh, apologise to Jenya for nearly letting a polar bear kill Linda. <laughs> I was there too. <laughs> I promise I won't do it again. <laughs> but thank you both. Very much. I'm going to lean upon moderator's privilege, prerogative, and insert myself to say something very quickly, which is that people say that uh, people quit jobs 
quit, don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad bosses. Linda was my boss for 17 years and I never once thought about quitting and I still work there. So. <laughs> we, have, we have a couple written ones. I could I could read them out abridged, but we're also getting into your, your final reflections time. Oh, don't, don't make me make a decision. Yeah. <laughs> With or without uncertainty. I... All right. It's your call. All right. Um, I, will, I will hold these then because they are they are quite long. And even if I abridge them harshly, uh, it, would, it would take a long time. Uh, I want to give a moment. Does anybody here who hadn't signed up want to, want to come and say a word or two? Ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not so disorganized, but I just yeah. want to say, Linda, you've been amazing. You've really enjoyed having you as part of our career all the way through, like, you know, when I first met you through Brian O'Neill's group and all the, I always wanted to get more involved in all the research you were doing, but, you know, we were working in parallel, but you've always been that. And like Murray, going to COP was an incredible experience. Thank you for providing that and giving us the connection to the international community. Something I think NCAR and UK doesn't do as well as they should. And so thank you for being a champion for all of that. Keeping us connected to the world of, of really like of change and what where we can take our science and put it back into that policy, back into that, that real perspective. So you've been a real champion for that. Um, I always appreciate the fact you came from agriculture. I'm a geographer as well. So it's wow. cool. Yeah, I, I know. Think I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> so good. But I've got a great respect and appreciation for everything you brought. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Richard Boss has a hand up. Richard Boss, go ahead. Hey, everybody. It's so neat to uh, be part of this. And I really thank you all for organizing it in such a way that you enabled, uh, you know, virtual participation. Um, the, uh, you know, the recollections I have of working with Linda and Linda, it's just been wonderful to watch, watch all the talks and also watch your reactions to all the talks. Um, are your, you know, kind of, I always think of you as being somebody as others who have said, just so open to new ideas and to transdisciplinary approaches. And one thing I don't know if it came up uh, as much was your role in the uh, National Academies. Committee on the Human Dimensions, uh, which was its uh, prior state before it became the Board on Environmental Change in Society. Um, you were always a great ally on that committee. I remember many, you know, sort of post-session uh, conversations with you over a glass of wine, figuring out how we're going to get the committee to move in this way or that. Um, uh, as as uh, Rob just mentioned, your directness. Um, you were one of my colleagues who I never had to wonder what your reaction was to my, you know, most recent crazy idea. Um, <laughs> and I really appreciated that. Um, and uh, I, I remember one incident when we were working on a CERTA project together. Uh, I think we were at Fort Bragg uh, in North Carolina, and um, both of us were having some trouble with the uh, seeming um, lack of acceptance of climate science. One of us had more trouble than the other in uh, not letting the, every, everyone else in the room know about their trouble with that. Um, you, you were uh, uh, unwilling, I think, to mask your uh, concern that they weren't all in on climate change and climate science. Um, uh, as as Rob mentioned, you were also somebody who was always in in joint projects, and for that I uh, am always grateful. Particularly, we had one big project, a national climate assessment uh, scenarios workshop uh, that we had to co-organize. Um, and I think that the thing actually started the day after Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving weekend. It was really just a huge effort um, to pull it together. Uh, and then just two other things, your clarity of thought and expression, um, and, you know, the fact that you came out of the humanities, was, you know, in philosophy was something that I always appreciated because it did give you access to a, a form of expression, which I really appreciated. Um, and you always made, you know, complex uh, climate science issues understandable and straightforward to the point that I always wondered, well, why haven't they solved that yet? It seems so straightforward. They should just go ahead and do it. 
Uh, and then, of course, your friendship and your support um, and your willingness to, to, to go all out in helping me and in helping others. So I do hope that your role as an NCAR fellow um, leaves you enough time to enjoy your retirement. Uh, and I also really hope that we can remain in contact. Thanks for everything. Anybody else? Um, <laughs> um, I will. Sorry. Oh, no, that's not. She just did. Okay. 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 Um, I will read out one one short sentiment <laughs> from Mr. Castro's letter, which I thought was, was really nice. Dr. Linda Burns has shown me that true success in science is not about making great discoveries and being famous. Rather, it is more about inspiring a spirit of discovery and selfless service in those whose lives you influence for the betterment of the whole of humanity. Wow. Whoa. Uh, so now we have some time for some ending sentiments from yeah. Dr. Burns herself. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you all for organizing. Thanks to all the organizers. The IPCC JPEG? No. Yeah. It's in, it's in uh, oh. must be there. It's in Friday. Oh, final thoughts. Yeah, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. That doesn't look like that. No, no. I, got yeah. it. I got it. No one's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interest. There we are. Final thoughts. Well, hopefully not that final. Final thoughts. It says that she needs a... We, we've got room mics on. So oh, so I don't need it? Okay. No. Yeah, you're good. All right. Well, all right. Well, can I get rid of this thing? Yes. Hide floating meeting controls. Hide floating meeting controls. Okay. Down to order. There, there you go. Okay, well, there you go. Well, so this has left me all pretty speechless. I mean, um, talk about uncertainty. When I imagined yesterday starting, I thought, what on earth is this going to be like? <laughs> I had no, I had no image. Except I pretty much expected nobody was going to diss me. <laughs> I thought, okay, we can, that's probably not going to happen. Um, but yeah, this has just been, you know, incredible. It, it, it's been, I think it, it's going to take me a while to take this all in, but it might actually cause me to sort of reevaluate my self-concept. <laughs> Because I didn't think I was that great. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess I'll have to really think about that and I'll let you know. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a couple of, a few slides of some fun things. One of the, one of the things I've appreciated about myself is my fun lovingness. <laughs> um, that if it's not fun, why do it, really? Um, so start, and also, well, Dr. Pekowski has kind of stole some of my thunder. So, hello. There, all right, I got it. Okay. Here we are. It began in the wheat. Okay, <laughs> so here it is in the wheat. Um, so, I will tell one short, I'll try to keep it really short, anecdote about the field work that I did for my dissertation, which I actually went out and visited all these farmers in uh, eastern Colorado and western Kansas. Um, right before I went, I went to a Halloween party, and um, people, there was a guy there who was painting people's faces. So I thought, oh, sure, hey, let's do this. So he painted my eyebrows blue and then put sparkles all over them. And this was really cool. <laughs> and I had a great time at this party. And then, but I was literally leaving the next day for this trip to visit these farmers <laughs> in an area that I thought was, I suspected that our political perspectives <laughs> would probably be different. Uh, and so I was concerned about that. Like, how am I going to get, how am I going to relate to these guys? Um, I got the sparkles off, 
but I couldn't get the blue off. <laughs> but I was going to visit them with blue eyebrows, and I thought, is this going to help develop a core? <laughs> Probably not. But I did. I learned something very important. One, none of them commented about the blue eyebrow. And I realized it doesn't matter, didn't matter because we had this one thing crucially important. We were both really interested about wheat. And that just made all the difference in the world. And um, I had these absolutely fantastic conversations. And it really, it was a key lesson about how to get along with people when you don't think you can. So that's my beginning of the story. All right. So, and our women in water. All right. So, one of the things I really had fun with, NCAR had developed some um, water bottles, and they made them NCAR water bottles by putting an NCAR label on it. Um, and I thought, oh, this is cute. This is really cute. Um, but I thought, gee, we could do more with these labels. <laughs> and so I um, got the, the backgrounds for the labels, and then I thought, all right, and if blessed by the senior scientists of NCAR, that seemed like a pretty obvious thing to say. But then I thought, okay, let's talk about women senior scientists. And at that time, uh, there when I started doing this, I guess, um, there were only seven. And um, so I put pictures of each woman senior scientist <laughs> on the label uh, and the number of women senior scientists they were, and then at that point, we said, collect all seven women and win. <laughs> win what? Well, <laughs> there we are. Um, and I just, this was just so much fun. And and not only that, but the women senior scientists really liked them. And I, and I got this lovely note from Clara Desser. Um, and she apologized for not being able to be here, but she, she referenced her water bottle. <laughs> And the fact how much she loved this water bottle and <laughs> would look at it, you know, daily and just be filled with, you know, the fun, the fun aspect of it, but also the, the more serious and the my ability to blend the serious and the the amusing. And um, that was very touching to me. So I just loved doing these. And I hope these water bottles which no longer exists in the real world, um, will continue. So here is um, when we finally got to 10 <laughs> scientists. Yes, double digits. Um, and this is when we all had lunch at Chautauqua. Uh, there's one person missing. But here we all are um, on the stairs there. And Tim Colleen, who was then director, um, sprung, up, sprung for us to all have lunch there. And I think he even I bought a bottle of uh, champagne lyrics. And then we have Betty Otto Gleisner. Here she is with her very own water bottle, <laughs> showing it proudly. So I really, I really loved doing that. And um, it was not only fun, but it was also, of course, also very serious. Ah, okay, back to Issy. So the pumpkin carving experiences in Issy. I would have a, a pumpkin carving party every year. I love Halloween. I love pumpkins. I love carving part pumpkins. And so we would do this. Here's Larry McDaniel uh, taking advantage of, you know, a higher level means <laughs> of uh, decapitating the pumpkin. <laughs> and here's Romero, uh, Patty Romero Lancao, who's a scientist in ISI, with her great pumpkin efforts. I thought that was a very very nice. But quite frankly, one thing, man, you can learn so much about people by watching them carve pumpkins. <laughs> you really, really can. And I remember very distinctly Susie Moser, who was in the group, a very intense person uh, and a really great scientist. But she went at carving this, her pumpkin like nobody's business. It was an intensity. It was just delightful. All right. And so here are the set of pumpkins. Wow. that we did one year and um it was really really very impressive impressive yes yeah. um, copy of this picture is available in 
the hallway. <laughs> um, okay, some of the things a lot of people have talked about NARCAP. Um, you know, NARCAP was a great experience. Here are all the uh, the PIs. Um, and we did have, we had NARCAP meetings every year, also at AGU. Um, and they were also a lot of fun. And especially because we ate a lot of chocolate during the meetings. But you can see everybody looked pretty happy there. And I think it's not just because of picture. Okay, we've heard about the peeps. Um, enough said, but I think the expression on uh, Seth's face makes this worth seeing. Um, and there you see the deflated peeps. <laughs> What is, what is your T-shirt say, Linda? Again, say Somewhere it. Ubi South Ubi. Okay. Always wear underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about having that be the saying on the cake. <laughs> My friend Susan sort of dissuaded me from that. Probably, yeah. The expression she suggested was a better one. <laughs> All right. Again, the risk party. Um, Melissa also showed this. This was a significant one because this was basically the party saying goodbye to Melissa uh, as she wandered off to Wyoming. So it was um, it was a really important party. Also, you'll note that a um, characteristic of Seth is he always you noticed he always colors his beard to match his shirt. <laughs> and he's done this for many, many years. Here he broke out and did the rainbow flag. Yeah. Speaking of rainbow flags, yes, okay. That's such a cute picture. Tigers are us. So there's a story behind this. And it's about experience of being gay at NCAR in the earlier years. Let's say before it was cool. <laughs> um, and I knew it wasn't cool because I, a colleague here, on here was really uh, ripped up by a supervisor about being gay. It was a very frightening experience, actually. Um, so I was a little scared, quite frankly. And but I wanted a picture of Jenya and me in my office, and it's like, ah, oh, yes. But then people will know. So a friend of ours had sent this card because she thought it sort of looked like us, of mm -hmm. these two tigers. Um, and so I put the tigers in a frame and I put the tigers on my desk mm -hmm. to represent us. And um, yeah, that was quite an experience. I also, I did this at the finally Asia, you actually had a, I don't remember, Seth, what was it called? It was a panel, but it was a, an AGU function, I don't know, maybe five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I showed this then, and, you know, the response was really very positive. So I, I think that's, is that the end? Oh, almost, all right. <laughs> so hail and farewell, sort of. I have one more thing to say, and it's a very serious thing. Um, it's about my whole career at NCAR. And as some of you know, I've had some really good times and I've had some really bad times. And I've thought a lot about how to say something about this without being overly grim and negative, but being, as people seem to think, I'm honest, so <laughs> it seem, um, so I'll say I have had good times and bad times. And I really thought a lot about why, why? Um, and one problem is kind of overarching one was the interdisciplinarity that I was a little bit too early for that to be comfortable at NCAR. And I, and I certainly suffered for that. Um, but some of the other bad times were because of decisions that leaders at NCAR made. Now, some of those, I think they were bad decisions for me, 
maybe not for the whole organization. Some of the decisions I felt were bad for the whole organization. And it made me think about, so why were some people put in leadership positions who really shouldn't have been there? And it brings me back to decision-making and under, under uncertainty. I think it's very, very difficult to make a good decision when you choose a leader. Talk about deep uncertainty. It's incredible. And not only that, you won't even know how bad the decision might have been for years. And that is a big problem for organizations. So I say in conclusion two things that um, an organization has to be very careful about the criteria they use for choosing leaders. And I think that has evolved in more or less a positive direction over time, but not completely. Number two about the good times I've had, partially just my own initiative, um, but also by having a few leaders around who were smart and kind. And those are the kinds of leaders you have to look for in this organization, even if they're not your immediate supervisor. Find them and stay with them. And I think that's everything I'm going to say. Great travel. <laughs> you can see from this picture. <laughs> and I really like it. What's that on your vest? Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much. So this is my my IPCC purple heart pin made by <laughs> Dr. Bukowski, because I would always make references that I really deserved a purple heart for all my IPCC work. And so <laughs> Melissa being a very multifaceted person is also a great artist. And so she made this for me, <laughs> which is of course a prized possession. <laughs> Well, thanks to everyone for coming and joining with us and uh, celebrating Linda, her career, and all the impact she's had on all of us. And we thank you for being here. We thank, thank Linda for being who she is. And we thank NCAR, UCAR, RAL, CGD, and Sizzle for sponsoring the session. So thanks, everyone. Let's applaud Linda one more time.